What is coming in the next version of Windows 10? We will find out. Plus, we'll talk about mobile devices and Xbox and beer and Microsoft to do. All that and so much more coming right up on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly, episode number 606, recorded Wednesday, January 30th, 2019. Living on the Edge. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at wordpress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at wordpress.com slash windows. Welcome to Windows Weekly. I am Megan Maroney. Leo Laporte is out this week, but I am joined by the real stars of Windows Weekly, Mary Jo Foley and Paul Therott. Thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you for joining us. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for joining them. Thank them for letting me join <laughs> them. And uh, Paul had forgotten, but uh, he claims to be pleasantly surprised that I'm here. Uh, with an actual oh, surface surprised. device. I think surprised. Surprised. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> How about yeah. not unpleasantly surprised? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't run or anything. Like okay. Uh, so the big uh, news is um, it's time to revisit what we're going to see in Windows 10 19 H1, which is not a flu shot, but a rollout. It Windows. should be. Exactly. The yeah. next bird flu. So it'll be speedier. Yeah, we think so. So um, first we should say that if you want to see a really great list of everything that we think is going to be in 19H1, go to howtogeek.com. They have a, an excellent post up, Chris Hoffman. Um, I, I had been kind of thinking 19H1 was an incremental smallish update until I saw his list. And I'm like, you know what? There's actually a lot of stuff that could potentially be in here. And I'm hedging it because it's not definite that any of these features are in there as Microsoft loves to tell us. Just because they're testing it as part of the insider build doesn't mean for sure that it will show up when they ship this thing. Yep. But his list, um, he, he notes as one of the very top things, which I had completely forgotten, is this, this uh, release should have better performance because there have been mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown that... Um, are being taken advantage of in this update. Yeah, so that's, remember, that's be good. there was a guy from Microsoft who, it was completely disconnected yeah. from the Windows team, who kind of said, you know, we figured out this way to mitigate Spectre and Meltdown mm -hmm. without hit, get, taking the performance hit. Yep. And it just kind of sat out there, but now, now apparently it is coming in that next version of Windows. So that's cool. Yeah, yep. The, the feature I thought, if you said to me what was going to be the biggest thing, I actually would have said the Windows sandbox. You Even though have said this sets. Is, I would not have said <laughs> sets because you know what? I, I don't think sets is going to be in there, do you? Oh no, it's not. That's what I was no. <laughs> yeah. the sets just has dropped off the face of the earth for some reason. I know. Uh, I don't yeah, think they sets. ever tested it in the context of nineteen H one, right? I don't think so. No. Yeah. Um but the Windows sandbox is um this feature that we had heard about in a previous Windows 10 test build, it was called mm -hmm. in private desktop um, at one point in a previous build. So some people had already started testing this. It's an enterprise feature. And what it does is it lets you run potentially suspicious software in a sandbox. So it's like in a, in a VM. Yeah. I think that's a big deal. You know, it it's not, it's not an example of every app you have can run in this VM. It's more for um, testing purposes, really. But still, it's a it's yeah. an interesting feature. Nice start. Um, people are very. It's excited kind of about a lightweight it. VM, so it's supposed to start up much more quickly than right. a traditional VM. Yep. So that's a big one. I feel like. I think if I if I had to pick one, honestly, it would be that ability to pause updates for home users, yep. right? Um, they've added this control to all versions of Windows 10, um, which is really just kind of a nice idea that you could, you know, if you had Pro or higher, you could always find it uh, deeper in the, in the wind. Hello, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting a snow squall warning. Uh oh, <laughs> it's important. 
<laughs> Actually, my wife and I both just separately noticed that it looked like we were having a snowstorm, but it was just snow squall. <laughs> Anywho, sorry had about a that. Ton of snow, right? It's just 20 and below you, there. Yeah. yeah. I know. No, we actually had like I, a family of a deer like hunkering in my yard last night. Like I've never, <laughs> they walk through my yard all the time, but this time they just sat, they were all like laying on the ground and like just staying there. Like they were, wow. cause it was just so nasty out. Oh, yeah. Did you let him in? <laughs> yeah, I well, actually, I wanted to, I liked it. <laughs> um, we all sat there in the window, like children, you know, looking at, um, That's cool. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, so in, uh, in windows Pausing 10 update. to date, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in Windows 10 to date, if you had Windows 10 Home, which most home users do, of course, there's no way to prevent updates. In fact, one of the things that changed over the past year is that Microsoft flipped a switch on, you know, check for updates where all of a sudden now you're a seeker and now you want the next uh, feature update, even though you probably don't. And it would kind of ham-handedly deliver you that when you were least expecting it. But now you can actually pause updates for the first time in Home. It's only for seven days, uh, yeah. but it's so much better than zero days. And hopefully the start of maybe a trend uh, to bring more of that functionality to the home side of the fence. Because right now, as Mary Jo has said many times, those people are essentially guinea pigs for the next update. Yeah. So you only get one seven-day delay. You can't keep doing yeah. it for more seven days yeah. at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I had somebody this week on Twitter ask me, they said, are you really not a seeker? Like, say you're going to go to the airport, right? Like, you don't actually check for Windows updates so that when you get to the airport, it's not suddenly you're in the middle of an update. I'm like, you know what? I live on the edge. I don't yeah, do Well, that. or you're normal, right? I, who who <laughs> normal would ever do that? Um, yeah. You know, sure. I mean, a power user or somebody who understands or cares about this kind of stuff might do that. But I, I mean, I kind of, Need your, I sit there and click for, you know, like an idiot pretty regularly, but I don't think that's normal. I mean, I don't see a therapist about it or whatever, but it's, <laughs> I, I don't think it's normal. Yeah. I, you know, it can happen that, that the update starts happening and you don't realize it. And then you're in a meeting or you're on a plane and suddenly you're like, yeah, now I'm right in the middle of updating. Uh, yeah, that can happen. But I, I just am willing to take the risk because I still am scared to, uh, to take 1809, for example. So I haven't done any seeking and I haven't gotten it yet on any of my <laughs> Windows 10 machines. <laughs> Don't do any seeking, Mary Jo. I'm not, not doing any like seeking. You find. Nope. <laughs> yeah, but the seven day thing is good. Uh, it's it's a start. Yeah. It's something. Yep. What about Cortana, separating Cortana from search? Why would you do that? Wouldn't you want them combined? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a complex one. I mean, I, there's been a, a company wide move to change what Cortana is. Um, I think it's going to be less of a front facing thing like it is now in Windows 10 and more of a back end service or app. Um, and if you want the functionality of a, a digital assistant, it's still going to be there. Uh, but if you just want to search your local file system, that will go back to the way it was before. I'm not sure I'd call this like a good feature or a great feature, but it's an important change for sure. I think it's going to make things less confusing for some normal users too, because I think yeah. when they were combined, people were like, what am I doing right now when I click yeah. in that yeah. box, you know? <laughs> right. So actually that search box, which says type here to search, like you can see that picture, yeah. it, says, it says that today, but when you t click on it, if you actually click on it, it brings mm -hmm. up this Cortana interface, which is like, yeah. what, what is this? You know, I, I, right. it, it's, I, I agree that that will probably help. Um, I don't think most people who go to the search box are actually are thinking Cortana. Yeah. I think they're thinking I need to find this thing and, and whatever Cortana may have had some functionality along those lines. But we've had Windows Search in this in the uh, start menu. Sorry, I I think since I don't know it's when it's XP maybe. Yeah, I know it's been a while. If not, certainly yeah. certainly Windows Seven. Yep. Best, and and I, I didn't real. I guess I didn't thoroughly realize this, but in the How to Geek article, they also note that in 19H1, the new search experience will let you search all of your PC files. So I think up till now, that's been kind of iffy how that works, right? Like sometimes yeah, it's when you in search, there, it's in there, but it's, it's yeah, in there, this, but this is yeah. the, what do you call this? This is like the, not confluence or integration or, you know, when you, when you combine these things, it's like, uh, and this is a Microsoft problem that goes back 20 years, right? Remember Internet Explorer, they're going to integrate it into the file system and you can search your, your local file system. You can search yeah. the internet, you know, as if those two things are one and the same, which they're not. Right. Um, so yes, I, I, you could do it. You can do it today. Of course you can, yeah. but 
Um, I think separating them makes sense. Yeah. For users, basically. Right. I think it, yeah, I, like I do think those are two separate things. Like sometimes I forget how to do something on my machine. So I type into the search box the thing I'm trying to do. And then I, the results come up right now before they've separated yeah. out Cortana and, yeah. and Bing. And I'm like, is this showing me a web result or a local result? I'm, I get confused what I'm looking at sometimes. Yeah. You can see this for yourself and, if you're using yeah. Windows 10. Just type, you know, hit start, start typing. I mean, it's kind of a weird deal. They have uh, tabs across the top for apps, documents, email, yeah. web, and more. But then down the list on the left, depending on what you type, you know, I see things like search suggestions, with have not, which have nothing to do with documents or for apps and other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I have search results for apps, documents, folders, and one place. <laughs> Apparently, I don't, what, yeah. what would be the place? Hopefully, it's a photo <laughs> of a window. Yeah, no, it's literally, I typed in Windows, by the way. The place <laughs> it came up with is called the Windows Tavern and Grill in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just kind of, it, it's a goofy... Yeah. combination of things it is mm -hmm. i think i think it can get a lot simpler and more clear about what you do because it's yeah. great to have this integrated in there but you want it to be a simple and intuitive experience right yep how excited are you about the new light desktop theme actually Woo! <laughs> I have to say, so when I saw photos of that, I thought this thing's too light. It's too light, right? Um, it's it's much lighter than the current light theme because there is a light theme. It, the default theme in Windows is the light theme. And by the way, even though Microsoft itself refers to this thing as a theme, in reality, it's not a theme because it's, it's actually, actually, let me look up the exact wording, because a theme is something that has been in Windows for a long time and a theme in Windows is a, uh, a package that includes a background wallpaper, icons, fonts, and other things, right? That's what a theme is. So if you go to the themes section of uh, the settings app, you're not going to find this thing, right? Mm. What this really is is an app color. And um, then you can thank Microsoft for the stupid wording on that. But um, anyway, mm. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> in, when I saw the images of it, I thought this thing is way too bright. But when you actually use it, it's actually pretty, it's really nice looking. And I have to say, the dark theme in Windows is pretty terrible, you know, compared to, say, the version in Mac OS, which is really nice. Um, this new light theme is is nice. It's actually really nice. So they they did a much better job on that, I would say, than they did on the dark theme. Other than the name, <laughs> you know, which is <laughs> classic. Right, so now it's yeah. going to be the dark theme and the white color. Is that how it's going to be? No, let me see. no. So it's see even like I said, even Microsoft will refer to it as a theme, and I think most people think of it as a theme, right? right? Yeah. Um, if you go into personalization colors, let me just find the exact wording here. Where is it? It's choose your color. <laughs> it says, and confusingly in 19H1, that's not what it says in previous versions. I think it's called app mode. I think is what it says. Um, actually, which you must you probably have it there, uh, Megan. What does that say there? Under. App mode, it's... App mode, app right? App mode, yep. Yeah, app mode. So they're, they're getting rid of that name because that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, in 19H1, it just says choose your color. And then you actually have three choices. is light, dark, and custom. Mm. And you would think that custom would let you, um, you know, customize the color <laughs> or something. Or maybe the <laughs> darkness of it. And that's not what that is. And it's not something that adjusts to like the time, like Apple's like no. night mode or, you know, night No, night. but that is, that is in Windows separately, of course, oh, okay. because why, why would it be in one place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anything else? Is that all the exciting stuff that's coming? Oh, well, we should talk about reserve storage, which oh. is, as we've talked about on Windows Weekly, Paul calls it the least controversial, controversial feature. Uh, no, wait, uh, uh, do I, I think he did call it that because people were outraged. So many people were like, what? Microsoft's going to hold back seven gigs on my machine for, for reserve sure. storage. I don't care that they're doing it to make updates better. I don't care if it's going to help people on storage constrained machines. But we think that is going to show up in, in 19H1. Yeah, I, I guess I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if it's the least controversial, but I, I think what I meant by that was, when you see a headline like Microsoft is going to reserve another seven gigabytes of disk space so you yeah. can have a better experience installing the next update, you can generate the headlines immediately. You know yep. <laughs> the kind of fake outrage that's going to occur because of that. So, yeah, I guess if you're still 
using a 32 gigabyte, you know, tablet from eight years ago or something, you, you might have some problems with that, obviously. But I, I don't think for most people this is a big, big deal. Um, this will trigger the same, you know, knee jerk uh, articles you always see around this kind of thing, like why 1,024 megabytes is not really a gigabyte and how uh, computer companies <laughs> change the, the, the way they measure disk space and how it doesn't make any sense and how you buy a computer or phone or whatever it is that has some amount of data or uh, disk space rather and what you're really getting is this smaller amount and blah 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 it goes on and on and on. but yeah I, I whatever you know so i I, yeah. I i think for most people honestly given the scheme that we're forced to live with which is that microsoft is going to update this stupid thing whether you want it to or not i'd rather have it go well you know frankly and i think in this age of um, cloud storage and whatnot i, I think more and more people are starting not to hoard everything on one computer where they need all the storage. They are syncing it to the cloud and accessing the bits they need on individual computers. And so maybe disk space is less mm -hmm. important, you know, for some of us at least. Yeah. So is there currently no storage set aside in Windows for updates? That's a good question. I know. Um, I, I'm like, I actually oh, don't know how it? it does it now. I would guess that it t uh, reserves the storage as you go to download the update. And that if you don't have enough, it will warn you at that point, and then you can run it. They have a wizard type thing; you can run to free up disk space. But it, it seems like they're proactively doing this. Microsoft's goal, of course, is to download this thing in the background, not tell you anything about it, right. get the install going, and do everything it can do without rebooting, and then kind of alert you at that point and say, "Hey, by the way, a quick reboot later, you're going to have a new version of Windows or whatever the update is." Mm. Um, and that sounds like a good experience, you know, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> yep. I guess we'll see. Oh, we forgot one other big feature. Mm -hmm. There are updates to Notepad. Oh, jeez. <laughs> How did nice. I miss that? I don't know. Right. But, um, you know, they're mostly things that would appeal to coders. Like there's changes to the way Notepad handles encoding. Um, there's mm -hmm. some new shortcuts available for opening new notepad windows, but there's also now a feature going to be a feature where there'll be an asterisk in the title bar when a file has been modified, but not saved. So, you know, a lot of people are like, why don't they add auto save to notepad? So this is kind of right. the next best thing. So the, the, there probably is a good reason for that. Um, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. So I'll just pontificate. It's a, it's a coding thing, like, right? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've no, like, um, yeah. If you think about how uh, Microsoft Office works today, if you're using OneDrive as you uh, as a save location, the auto save feature comes on. That's it's available. But if you try to save it to like the desktop or some location on your local disk, I don't believe it does. And I think that's tied to the same reason why mm -hmm. they're not doing it in Notepad. I don't think most people are necessarily syncing their Notepad documents to the cloud. I suppose they could be, but I am. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I am too, but, you know. See? Huh. <laughs> Honestly, there's a lot more going on here. I mean, uh, this, like Barry yeah. just said, it is kind of a big release. The, there's a lot more uh, built-in apps you can uninstall, uh, which has always been kind of an issue for certain people. Um, there's, a, it, with regards to the update thing we were just talking about, there's an icon they'll throw in the taskbar tray area now when there's a pending update, which honestly is a helpful kind of visual cue. There's the passwordless sign-in capability, which is actually... Pretty monumental, and I still, I actually still haven't tested that. I'm embarrassed to say, but you can get walk up to a new or recently reset Windows computer, type in your phone number, um, and initiate a login to your Microsoft account that you've associated with that number. You will still do all the you know two FA stuff if that's what you have set up, but um, without having to type in your username or password, right from the get go. That's that's pretty big. And there's a, you know there's a bunch of that stuff. It, it's yeah. it is it is a it's a good update. I think Alex uh, wanted me also to mention that there are new emoji coming. Yeah, thanks, Alex. <coughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the <laughs> the control board or wherever he is. Uh, it looks like there are additional accessibility emoji um, wheelchair, two different kinds of wheelchairs, yep. and a cane. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. There's that one, I forget what you call it, the emoji where it's like the shrug emoji and all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are those things the called? The Paul emoji that looks like a oh, slug. Um, I mean a sloth. Like ASCII emoji? <laughs> yeah, what's got you know? a Japanese Emoticon? Name, right? Oh, it looks like it's cam emoji? 
Camo. Is it the, yeah. the condo emoji? Ko emoji. Uh, yeah. Ko emoji. Ko emoji. <laughs> so like a little person folding a, a cloth. Yeah, exactly. Right? It just yeah. folds it into like a perfect little thing. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, it looks like, or I don't know how you'd pronounce it. It's Kao emoji. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like the flipping the tables. That's my favorite. Yeah. Um, I might do that later. <laughs> and not an emoji. After the show is over. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's over. <laughs> Um, all right, so should we move on to where we are now with new feature updates? Yeah. Sure. Where are we now with new feature updates? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> where are we? Oh, the first thing, this terrible thing. So uh, not to re-dredge up the history of our latest update, but as everyone knows, 1809 was completed in September, rolled out in October, was taken back, took six weeks to come back. It's been rolling out really slow ever since. And so... Back in, I want to say December, it was probably on, I think it was roughly 6% of Windows 10 PCs out in the world. The good news is, I guess, uh, this month, usage has doubled to almost 12%. That's still, or over 12%, That's it looks like. tiny, right? Still a, a really small amount, yeah. And because, you know, it, until last week, it wasn't really broadly available. It was available to seekers, mm -hmm. right? And so what they're saying now is automatically they're going to start delivering it to computers that meet its uh, compatibility requirements. So I think the next month or two, we're going to see a big surge here, which is good see because that? we only have a month or two. <laughs> I know. Until the next month. So I, I was curious what's going to happen there. So say you don't get the update by April and then the yep. next update starts rolling out, the April update. Yep. Um, well, yeah, you'll, so just, you'll just go you right just that. get the April update, right? Because they're cumulative? Well, yeah, or that's no? true. Um, but the situations in which that would happen are probably smaller than people believe, right? Yeah. Um, because eight, uh, 1903, which is the next one, 19H1, will be rolled out in a measured fashion as well, right? And True. so yeah. it's I, I, I suppose Microsoft could at some po point halt the deployment of 1809, but I don't believe they've mm. ever actually done that. No, they haven't. Uh, I just received a new computer from Huawei that has 1803 on it, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yep. Um, it's possible that you could get 1809 after 1903 was completed, right? Because right. your computer suddenly made met the requirements of that release compatibility-wise, but still doesn't meet them for 19H1. Mm -hmm. And then three or four or six or whatever months later, maybe you get 19H1. Right. <laughs> but that it is an interesting problem because the, yeah. the delays here are worse than we've ever seen. And so this is mm -hmm. the first time we've ever seen a release really bump up against... The next one, remember the previous release set a record for how, mu how many of the computers it went to, the, the percentage mm -hmm. of computers. It, the, the usage share of that was very, very high, which we had never seen before. Yep. That's not going to happen with 1809. No. Why was it so high last year? Um, I, well, yeah, well, that's a good question too. So uh, it actually was delayed somewhat, uh, but then they were very aggressive in deploying it. And they were so taken by the success that they had that they very aggressively shipped 1809 out the door and to disastrous results because after they shipped it weeks early, by the way, uh, they discovered or <laughs> they discovered is the wrong term because everyone knew about these problems, but they finally acknowledged the problems that people had already reported and had to pull it back. So it went well, you know, it, once it, the last one, 1803, went out the door, it did they did deploy it very quickly. Mm hmm. Uh, and it, I guess that worked out, but it didn't work out for 1809. Yeah. Yeah, so then the next one coming, 19H1, which we also call 1903 because it's going to RTM in March 2019. But we think the official name of which will be the April 2019 update because that's when it will start rolling out to the mainstream. That, that release is in bug bash right now. So it doesn't mean they won't, add any more new features to it, but it's it's largely unlikely we'll see anything big before it RTMs. Right. And this week they had their, um, what do they call that? The webcast that they do for insiders around the bug bash. And they told them mm -hmm. a slow ring build of 1903 should be out very soon. And today they reopened the skip ahead ring, which means they're about to start releasing 
19H2 builds. So if you are interested in seeing what comes out early for 19H2, and it's not usually very interesting. It's usually pretty much almost identical feature-wise with what's in 19H1. Yeah. Um, you can enroll your device as of today, like just an hour or so ago, in the Skip Ahead ring. I mean, even within the world of enthusiasts, don't you think there's kind of a a feeling that we need to slow this down a little bit? <laughs> it's like, I know. You know, we, we, 1809 yeah. is uh, not being deployed very quickly, but I, that's probably changing as we speak. 19 yeah. H1 is uh, just about done. Mm -hmm. They're getting ready to roll that thing out, and and we're going to test 19 H2 as well. I know, I know. Yeah, it's it just seems a quick. bit much. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I think you know, for businesses, it makes a lot more sense because the way they tend to do it is they have like a few people on the skip ahead, like very few, just doing some really early testing. Right. Everybody else is doing you know more mainstream testing on the 19 H1, and then. They're slowly rolling out to their customers 1809. So I feel like they're taking a more measured approach also because they can pause updates. Um, but for consumers, it just kind of feels like we're on this break, breakneck runaway train pace with with these yeah. updates. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, what's the benefit of Skip Ahead? Like why would someone want to do it? If you're an enthusiast well, and you're... Or you're yeah. like Paul Thorat and you're a crazy lunatic, then <laughs> you might want to try out the latest and greatest. Right. Well, I've actually cured myself of that last problem, not the crazy lunatic part, but the uh, <laughs> <laughs> desire to <laughs> want to test the very latest. Um, I used to be, I certainly was like that for a long time. Uh, and it, yeah, you would imagine that a lot of the people in the inside a program are those types of people. They're enthusiasts. They always want the latest and the greatest and yeah. want to see the next version and so forth. But so Microsoft gives them that opportunity. Um, I didn't think that when they first announced Skip Ahead, I didn't think it was going to be a permanent thing, right? Because remember back yeah. when they did it, they were making a pretty major change to the way that uh, updates worked, I thought, um, probably 17 versions ago or something. But yeah. uh, it seemed like they were going to, I think it had to do with like Delta updating. I, I don't remember the exact deal, but they were making a pretty significant change. And I thought it was just going to be for that particular version. And, that kind of made sense to me. But like you just said, you know, the way this works in the beginning, if you opted into um, skip head right now and you actually got to build, the very best you could hope for is that it would be roughly the same as what you see in 19H1. But actually more often than not, we've seen in the past, you're behind, right? So there are new features coming in the current, I don't know what to call it, the currently developed uh, version of Windows 10, whatever. Um, the skip ahead version is actually behind. So you actually have less stuff. Yeah. So in some mm -hmm. ways, less new stuff, less of the new stuff or whatever. Um, it, it, that kind of runs contrary to the mindset of the people who would want to be in skip ahead. And I, frankly, I just don't, I don't quite get it. But yeah. What else is new? <laughs> you know what else I'm going to be curious about? So I, I found out the code name of 19, the thing we would normally call 19H2 is vanadium. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason it's Vanadium is they're syncing up their code names and their development process with the Azure team now that the engineering teams are combined. So I, I'm curious if they're ever going to call this Vanadium or if they're going to call it 19H2. Um, right. I, I'm just, I mean, I just care about that because I'm crazy about code names. But um, <laughs> we all have I think it's going to be really, <laughs> so it's going to be weird, right? Like we were on Redstone. We were doing Redstone, yeah. you know, one, two, three, four, five. Then we switched to 19H1. Now we may yep. switch back to a code name again to talk about these builds. Yeah, so 19H1, what was the real code name of that? Um, Redstone 6, was, right? It was, uh, But then they dropped it, right? For, they, they never they came before 19... They, they okay. never used Redstone because, 6, yeah. Yeah, in, pre, in the Redstone builds, there would always be an RS whatever number in the yeah. build string. In this one, it actually it does say 19H1, so... Right. In other words, maybe you would see that name in the yeah. build string or it would say 19H2. Yeah. I'm going to guess they're going to stick with the 19H2. Yeah. Be interesting. Sorry, I was looking at the side effects of vanadium. Um, don't, <laughs> don't eat it. Don't, yep. don't play don't around with it. vanadium. <laughs> don't uh, put your hands in your mouth after you handle yes, it. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> if you're pregnant, you might want to stay away from vanadium. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> don't let your pets eat it. <laughs> also. Right. Uh, all right. So um, I, I think we'll take a break and thank our sponsor. Okay. And then you have more to talk about, more Windows stuff, more mobile stuff, uh, Xbox, Office, all good stuff. But first, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, WordPress. Now, if you are out there and you want to have a brand or even if you just even if you don't want to have a brand, everyone should have a place on the Web that's their own uh, that when someone searches for you, they find that. I have one. Uh, it's meganmaroney.com and it is powered by WordPress. I love WordPress. I've been using it forever. It's easy to use and it doesn't take a lot of uh, time and energy. They have powerful site building tools, thousands of themes, 24 seven support from real experts, real people. WordPress.com lets anyone pursue whatever it is they love by launching a site that's free to start with the room to grow. WordPress.com was started so anyone can publish their ideas. No two-week trials, no hidden fees. WordPress users can uh, own their own content and you'll own it forever. The WordPress platform is so flexible and powerful that some of the biggest companies on earth use it to build their websites. And millions of people use WordPress.com every day to turn their dreams into reality on the web. And WordPress now powers 33% of the internet. That's 33% of the internet. You can uh, get 15% off any new plan right now. All you have to do is go to wordpress.com slash windows. That's 15% off any new plan purchase. Wordpress.com slash windows and 15% off your new website. Go to wordpress.com slash windows. And we thank WordPress for their support of Windows Weekly. All right, so more Windows. Uh, Paul, did you want to talk about the controversy of Windows 7 that is not actually a controversy? <laughs> not really, <laughs> but I will. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Windows' latest side of the Microsoft support document had been updated to note that um, the metadata services in Windows 7 for things like Windows Media Player and Windows Media Center we're going to be turned off because basically no one's using them. And what that means is if you're, you know, you want to search your music collection using Windows Media Player for an artist name or anything that might be in the metadata for a media file, um, that might stop working. Now, the reason this isn't a huge controversy is if you're already using it, it actually will continue to work. What's going to happen is that it, it just won't download new information anymore. So I suppose if you were to install Windows 7 and get your CD collection going on your Windows Media Player application here in 2019. You're not going to you're not going to be in particularly good shape. But there's probably not very many people that would ever do such a thing. But I've seen these reports on other websites that are, you know, like Microsoft has found another sneaky way to force people to upgrade to Windows 10, and it's like I it's not really that dramatic. Um, I, I will say this for me personally, this is kind of a big deal because many of the books I've written are about the digital media features that have been available starting back in Windows XP. And I, I wrote specific books about all this stuff, you know, Media Center, um, Windows Media Player, and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the end of an era. So it's kind, of, it's kind of weird to look back on that for that reason. But, I mean, even back in the Windows 8 time frame, which was over six years ago, when they were originally going to basically just cancel Media Center, and then I think they made it an optional install, Steven Sanofsky, remember, had some kind of a quote about the percentage of people that were even launching this thing, not by mistake, like launching it on purpose. <laughs> and it was some one-tenth of one percent. It was some tiny, I don't know if you remember, Mary Jo, what the exact figure was, but it was something really tiny. And that was, like I said, over six years ago. It was a long time yeah. ago. So if you have your music and movie collection on a Windows 7 PC, it's In fine. media in media. Mm -hmm. Well, no, center. if you're doing that, there's something wrong with you. But <laughs> but uh, if you do do that, yes, it will continue working. Okay. Um, oh, you found the article. That's funny. Um, yeah, I think eventually, I think if, if I'm remembering it correctly, they were originally going to kill it. And so many people in the beta complained that they decided to make it available as an optional install. Of course, they never upgraded it or updated it in any way. So, it, you know, it was basically as minimally supported as something can be. So 
So no controversy. Controversy. No, no. Although it's, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's just like reserve storage, though. You saw so many people writing headlines and on Twitter, like, this is an outrage. This is them forcing us so, to get off Windows 7. <laughs> neither one of these is an outrage. I, I will say that I the the uh, the disk space reserving is a bigger issue. Yeah. Uh, but on a list of issues, it's like number 800, not number 1,200. I mean, it's still it's still <laughs> not a big deal, but it's... It, yeah. It's certainly going to import, impact more people than this Windows Media metadata thing. Yep. And what about Microsoft To Do? Um, is there a to do about that? <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, this one. Okay, here's a legitimate controversy for you. So Cortana, which is now being uh, ripped apart from Windows Search. I mean, one of the controversies, this is a legit controversy, is, you know, this thing debuted in Windows 10 when it, shipped um, and it integrated with something called Wonderlist, mm -hmm. not with Microsoft's own to-do service. Uh, they bought Wonderlist. They're make, turning it, you know, they, they're upgrading to-do now. But uh, for many years, that was a weird, just a weird thing. You could, you could integrate Cortana with a handful of Microsoft services, but not to-do and with Wonderlist. And so fairly recently they, uh, they flipped the switch on that. And now that's generally available. So, no matter how you're using Cortana, if you're using it in Windows 10 on a mobile device or Xbox, whatever, the it will now integrate with Microsoft To Do, which is the you know task to do system that most Microsoft users would want to use anyway at this point. So they finally turned that on. Do you two use it? No. No, it's funny you say that because this came up last week too, and. It uh, no, and it's only because, well, I'll let Mary, because I think Mary Jo and I handle this the same way, right? So We do, right. So we both use our calendar as our to-do, basically. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at my calendar, it's it looks like a to-do list. Like I, I put all kinds of little things into my calendar and it shows up that yep. way in Outlook. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, um, I have started doing reminders uh, that, that are kind of one-off things. Um, I'm making an egg. Remind me in five minutes to stop making the egg or whatever. You know, I'll, I'll use my voice and use Google Assistant through one of the devices in the kitchen or whatever. Um, but I don't think of that as like a formal process type of thing. You know, if, if it's important and I want it to be done at a certain time or be notified at a certain time on a certain day, yeah, I use the calendar. What do you use for a grocery list? My wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Who, I use uh, OneNote no. for that, actually. That's one of the only things I use OneNote for. Grocery list. Yep. So I, by the way, I've, <laughs> my wife and I do use OneNote for a couple of things. We, she doesn't use it for the grocery list. I have suggested to her this multiple times and multiple times she has gone to the store and has called and said, could you take a picture of the grocery <laughs> list? I've got to take it off because it's on a piece of paper on the side of the refrigerator, right? So this has happened multiple times. And then this past week she left the house, uh, lost it, Thought she might have dropped it on the way of the car. My daughter is outside, going outside to try to find it. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, you know, mom said she might have dropped the thing outside. And, you know, we never found it. And I literally just had this conversation, you know, you, you carry a phone, right? <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, uh, no, too, 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 too often. Or yeah. add it to, like, does she use the Google Assistant? Like, does she talk to devices mm -hmm. in your house? Yeah, she could just yeah. tell it and then it's on. Yeah. Right, you can say yeah. to um, your phone, add this to my shopping list, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, so um, I, I, I can't, ex I'm, look, I'm not the one not doing this, but I mean, I early on in this type of thing, uh, we got an Amazon Echo, and remember that was one of the things you could do, was make a shopping list. And yeah. she was intrigued by that, um, and she experimented with that, but then of course we went Google and I don't know, I think it just went by the wayside, but hopefully if she loses enough of these paper-based lists, that will change. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm familiar. Maybe with she you. could use Office Lens and take a picture of the shopping yeah. list. Yeah, and then use like the OCR thing to translate yeah. it into actual text. And uh -huh. yeah, Does yeah, that's she, like a real misuse of technology, right there. It is. <laughs> Does she use an iPhone? <laughs> no, she, she has a Samsung phone. Oh, interesting. Um, does To Do have like location reminders, like the iPhone reminders? No, I don't believe, I shouldn't say. I'm actually not sure. I don't use it. Um, does it have location reminders? That does not sound familiar, but um, hmm. yeah, I'm not sure. But now you can use Cortana with it. That's a good idea. Why did you ask that? What, what well, does Well, because that's do that, what right? I use with Apple reminders. Like I'll put my grocery list in there yeah. and then it mm -hmm. shows yep. up on my phone when I get to when you Lucky to or store. Safeway or, yeah. Yep. No, that's smart. Um, 
I know I've heard of this and I was just trying to, I was just, what I was just freezing on was whether or not Google or Amazon does that. And I can't remember where I've seen it, but that's a good, yeah, that's, See, that's a good use of technology. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. Except for when you forget to turn it on. So I have like, I it's one point in my <laughs> life I needed coriander seeds at Whole Foods. And right. um, I now every time I drove, drive by Whole Foods, um, <laughs> it, mentions it coriander says seeds. coriander seeds. Right. Which, right. Um, yeah. Just in case you need it again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you only once <laughs> need to yeah. buy coriander seeds. You never need to buy them more than Good thing you didn't put it on Amazon. You would just get them automatically every two weeks <laughs> yes. or something. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, so we can move. Well, we were talking about mobile. We can continue talking about mobile. Um, and we can continue talking about Microsoft to do that you don't use, but you can use it with attachments <laughs> yes. now. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I've actually had uh, Microsoft to do as an app pick uh, several times over the past year because after a year or two where it kind of never really improved and I never did that integration with Cortana, which everyone thought was really strange. Um, to do development has really picked up and there's a, a big integration going on in that group between uh, all of the to do endpoints you might see in the Microsoft ecosystem if you're using tasks or to do or whatever they're calling it and outlook.com or an outlook the application outlook on the web and so forth these things kind of all integrate together and um, yeah and so the application is just updated a lot and so one of the things that it was just updated with was the ability to attach a file like you would in an email or whatever to a to do. And so that can, you can understand why that might be really helpful. Um, you know, that attachment could be the, uh, you know, it could be the mail, shopping the uh, list. shopping list, right? Exactly. <laughs> yep. Or whatever. Um, you know, remember to do this thing at this time. Oh, here's the thing you need that you need to reference mm -hmm. to, you know, to make that happen. That's, that's kind of a smart way to do it too. And so the Surface Go and the Surface Laptop 2 are getting um, some firmware updates, some related to 1809. Yeah. So one of the weird things about 1809, which we mentioned up front, was that it just hasn't been deploying very quickly. One of the things we didn't mention is that it isn't deploying very quickly to Microsoft's own devices, um, yeah. which a lot of people think are, is strange. And I actually kind of agree with that. You would think that Microsoft's own systems would be on the known good list right away, and that would happen. And so that's not been the case. Um, and I think in both of these cases, but explicitly in the case of uh, Surface Go, at least, the ups, uh, some of the updates that were included in the firmware batch went out this past week are related very specifically to 18.09. And so it's possible that just by installing these firmware updates and then clicking check for updates again, you might actually finally get 18.09 if you didn't get it already on those devices. Do either of you use the Surface Go? I do. Regularly or just on the go? <laughs> nice. Um, mostly on the go. Uh, when I when I think I might need to look at a laptop, but the chances are fairly low that I'm going to have to type a lot because the keyboard's a little iffy for me on that. Um, but it's like a nice backup thing to just be able to throw into my bag and be like, okay, just in case I have to write a story or do some major edits to a story, I've got it with me. I have Gorilla Hands, uh, so I could not possibly use this device. Um <laughs> Honestly, the keyboard is really like me, little. It's a little. Yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time typing on phones, you know. So as like kind of an older guy with huge hands, it's nice to be able to speak now. To, so, so people probably think I'm insane. I'm just talking into my phone. They think I'm talking to them, but I'm sending a text message or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And do you I use never, the, You know what's weird? I Do you, do you Megan, use your phone that way? Do you talk to it a lot? Because I, I almost never do, and I don't know why I don't. I don't know. I don't. I mean, occasionally you know. when I'm driving, if I really have to, if I feel like I really have to send yeah. someone a message, well, but I'll do that. Are you guys able to type accurately into a phone? At least mm -hmm. accurately enough that autocorrect happens and it works and it's fine? Yes, we both have <laughs> delicate tiny hands. Yeah, like little <laughs> Tyrannosaurus like. Rex hands that you kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. like. Mostly. <laughs> no, because I, the, the issue for me is just that I've had so many times where what should be uh, an obvious autocorrect hasn't occurred, you know, and it's very frustrating and I'm, you know, I'm all thumbing it and it's terrible. And if I speak into it, it usually works pretty well, you know, mm -hmm. and I can, my text messages or anything I type like that, you know, have, have gone from these really small, short things to like a paragraph, like I can actually talk, you know, yeah. so I found it to be very helpful. I paradoxically find it annoying when I see other people talking out loud to themselves, but, um, 
<laughs> what can I do? That's, <laughs> it's okay the only for way you. I can use the thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the rules are different for me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure there's some sort of like gender thing we could get into I know. about that. Like, I bet there is because be. my brother-in-law always only talks to his phone and I'm like, huh, I almost never do. That's interesting, right? Yeah. My dad does and my mom doesn't. My husband doesn't, but he barely uses a phone at all. So, um, oh. yeah. I mean, it's not like I ever walked around with like a little portable recorder and was like, note to self, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like whatever. I mean, I never... I don't like, I don't want to listen to it. Sure. I just, you you, know, but, you, sure. I bet you are that guy. <laughs> but, you know, transposing like voice to text is really useful. You know? Do you ever write stories with your voice? No. I yeah. always dreamed that I would like, very early on I, because I, I, I was always kind of on the verge of carpal tunnel and I've been, I use um, very specifically use ergonomic keyboards and mice all the time. Um, it's hard for me when I travel too much because you have to, you know, you're in a laptop keyboard and then you're really kind of on top of it. Um, but I always figured at some point it was going to get me and the only way I was ever going to be able to write would be to narrate it essentially. And so I used to test that stuff a lot and, um, I hated it. I mean, I really hated it and I, you know, I've never written a story that way and I hope never to, but I guess you never know. I don't know. Not so far. So where were we? Let's see. Uh, Nokia phones. Finally, they'll be sold through U.S. wireless carriers. Yeah, I mean, you know, for for Microsoft fans, you know, kind of miss the the Windows Phone days. Um, HMD, HMD, yes, HMD has done a nice job with the Nokia brand, um, and they've they've been very aggressive about releasing new models and upgrading them and all that kind of stuff. But there's been no real way to get them through wireless carriers here in the United States, and so that's actually changing. They've actually gotten some deals now with some of the major carriers, and um, you know, for the next, you know, going forward now, you, you'll see that as an option when you go in a store. And for a lot of people, that's a great way, you know, to, to choose a phone, right? I mean, it's not, I, I, I have go kicking and screaming into these stores, but for a lot of people, that's how they do that. And so uh, Verizon obviously is the biggest wireless carrier in the United States. Cricket Wireless, if I'm not mistaken, I think is owned by at and I think so. Hmm. Um and they, I, I, yeah, they're around. They have retail stores for sure. I think of them more as like an online thing, but actually they are around as well. Um, based on AT and T, I guess, or based on I think they're AT and T's network. But anyway, it's a good it's a good step. You know, uh, not being on carriers has hurt a lot of uh, phone makers for sure over the years, and um, getting on Verizon is great. So that's good news for them. Yeah, Cricket uses uh, AT and T's nationwide network. Yeah. I don't think it's wedding. owned by AT and T, but I think they might sublease it or something. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> so neither of you are going to run out to get a Nokia phone. I mm -hmm. actually, I'd love to use a Nokia phone. I, I, I think they're beautiful looking they make devices. Great phones. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would definitely consider one. I mean, for me, you know, camera is a big deal, and I'm not sure any of the Nokias are up there yet. But they did just license the Peerview name and. They have a deal with Zeiss for lenses, and um, you never know. Hmm. Office 365, they're going to use OneDrive as a default save location. It sounds like you guys both already use OneDrive as a default save location, as your default. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's why I was talking about that uh, autosave thing. I, that's something I just happened to notice. I was curious why the little switch, you know, <laughs> wasn't coming on. I... I often, I save to my desktop usually to just for scratch space and then move things around. But I noticed when I opened something that was actually in OneDrive, it was like, oh, this can, we can auto save this, you know, mm -hmm. which is actually pretty useful. You know, what's funny though about this. Um, so Microsoft just made this announcement that this is going to become the default. I already thought it was the default. Mm. Right. So I was like, wait, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, if you haven't done it, it's and, and you if you well if you use Word or, or one of these apps, it's it's almost worth looking at because uh, how they're doing it because um, that dialogue that pops up is very reminiscent of what you see on the web version of these apps, and it mm -hmm. bears no relation whatsoever to how Save works on the what we think of as the Office 2016 apps today. Um, if you're if you're in one of those apps and you hit Control S to save the uh, the save dialogue it's not even a dialogue it takes over the whole application it's like a crazy convoluted thing and um 
I think you can, I mean, you can, I know you can, you can set a default save location for sure. Um, and Windows has a control for uh, changing default saves yeah. to uh, uh, to OneDrive locations as well. But mm -hmm. this is, you know, built into the app and it's a new interface. I, and that's kind of the interesting part to me because I keep waiting for that simplified ribbon to appear. I'm on the Office Insider. It's only available on commercial accounts, you know, yeah, whatever. But um, I keep looking for this big change that's coming. And I think this is part of it, right? They're simplifying the UI. And so that thing that comes up, not only is it simpler to look at, but it's simpler for people. You know, you are you save it in OneDrive and you open it somewhere else on a, your open Word on uh, your phone or another PC. It's going to be there, right? It's in the, you know, the most recently used list that comes up right as you run the app. Like it's it's literally simpler just to do it this way. Can you use other cloud services? Like, can you? Make no, your you're own? not allowed, Megan. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, you can. Um, yeah, no. They they have integration points for you know Box and Dropbox and whatever. So yeah, iCloud, uh, Box and uh, Drop. <laughs> And <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just want to see if I can do the weirdest stuff, like you know. Okay, so if you wanted to use iCloud, iCloud I, on the Surface, yeah, you can. Um, there's an iCloud client for Windows, right? Which is kind of a control panel. Mm -hmm. um, you could you could do like a file system sync kind of thing. If you wanted to, you could save to iCloud um, from Windows. I imagine there are seven or eight people who actually do that, mm -hmm. but it is possible. And OneDrive space is like half the price of iCloud, isn't it? It's probably less than half the space. Yeah, it's probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, just by having an Office 365 account, which is what enables this, by the way, uh -huh. um, you have a terabyte of storage per uh -huh. user. So, yeah. Yeah, just by having an iPhone, you get nothing. <laughs> yes, exactly. No, you get an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. What is next? Are we... Um, Oh, time to talk. Time to talk about Apple again. You put this in there. I didn't. Um, there was some news uh, from Cheddar uh, of all places that uh, that Apple might yeah. be coming up with a game uh, subscription service like Net Netflix for games. And what do you think this is going to look like? First of all, I want to apologize to Mary Jo. Um, not just because this is kind of an Xbox topic, but for some reason these notes worked out to be some kind of back-to-back -back me thing. <laughs> so, sorry. No, about no. That. I mean, you know what? Um, there wasn't a lot of Microsoft news the past. Yeah, there the really past. wasn't. No. Um, also, I'm getting tired of talking. But so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, my, my, I've I've often made the contention or made the point that Microsoft is uniquely placed um, to have a successful cloud-based gaming service in the future. Right? They have the Azure infrastructure. They have the experience with Xbox. They have um, services that are trending in that direction, like Xbox Game Pass, where they're not literally streaming games, but they're heading they're heading there. Um, and there really aren't too many companies who have that infrastructure that could take them on. That said, every major tech firm on earth has announced or is rumored to be working on something like this, right? Google has a game service they're working on. Amazon has a game service they're working on. Sony has a game service, period. Uh, and now Apple apparently is going to have one as well. And so I think what this speaks to is a couple of things. But um, the big one is just that gaming is bigger than entertainment. Entertainment meaning things like movies and TV. Um, the, the market, the money that can be made in this market is actually significantly bigger than everything that Hollywood does. And I think that kind of explains the interest in this. Because even a small piece of that pie could be pretty lucrative. And of course, Apple has endpoints for this service in the form of iPhones and iPads and and Macs and so forth. And so it doesn't, it's not something I would have predicted, I guess I'll say it that way. But now that I see that it, they're apparently working on it, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, see, I said nine ninety nine to Leo. We were discussing this on iOS today and he said that would be way mm -hmm. too much. But you say that it looks, yeah, nine ninety nine a month. Yeah, um, well. But Discord has something like that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the, this is like only slightly related to this, but one of the rumors or one of the things that we think is going to happen this year is Microsoft's going to release a Microsoft 365 subscription for consumers. And one of the questions around that is going to, is what does that mean? What, like, what's, what, what does that entail? And what people would like to see, a lot of people, is Xbox be part of that? And right now, Microsoft has uh, at least two Xbox related 
uh, online services, which one of which costs nine ninety nine a month, Xbox Game Pass, which is l literally the forerunner of this, you know, cloud streaming game service. And then they have an Xbox Live Gold account, which is actually only sixty dollars a month. So we'll call that whatever that is, five seven dollars a month, whatever. Um, I think for this thing to succeed, from Microsoft, nine ninety nine a month or a hundred dollars a year, you know, uh, is kind of the going rate. And so they would need to combine all that stuff at that point, um, for this to make sense. So I think nine ninety nine does make sense. Um, right now you're technically paying more if you're in the Microsoft side of the fence and you are on Sony as well. So it's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this would be, this is interesting because it, the Apple gaming service would be very different. I mean, if it is just a purely iOS games, well, uh, you know, as we just learned this week, um, there are 1.4 billion active in use iOS devices out in the world. Right. 900 million of which are iPhones, right? And so there's an audience. I mean, the total install base of PCs uh, in the world is 1.5 billion. I think Android is at 2 billion. So these are all big platforms. Um, they're big enough to support this kind of service. We know that Apple has services today, like iCloud. You just mentioned they have uh, the Apple Music, of course, they're definitely going to launch a video service, TV service, whatever you want to call that of some kind in the near future. And Tim Cook has talked about services that Apple will introduce this year. Um, it doesn't mean the gaming one would happen, but, uh, and I'm sure their lack of success with gaming on Apple TV is a bit of a question mark around this, but I, yeah, I mean, I think this makes sense. Apple devices have really good hardware, really good graphics, uh, metal capabilities for, writing directly to the hardware and so forth. Um, there's no reason those things couldn't be, well, they are, they're, they're already incredible game machines, but um, game streaming for sure. I could, I could definitely see this happening. But then the large number of iOS gamers is casual gamers. That's people like playing Candy Crush yeah. and they're used to just getting games for free. They don't mind, um, you have to pay for the in-app purchases, but that that's sort of a mindless thing. They don't mind ads. Yeah. Whereas like you don't have that community on Xbox who's like, well, I'll, yeah, I'll play this free Xbox game and I don't mind some ads. Like they're used to paying. So the, the way that this makes sense, to, I think even to casual gamers is that it includes games. And so if you look at um, the cost of gaming on an iOS device, um, actually the model there is pretty different than it is for, from uh, other platforms on Android. They often have to give a game away for free and then charge you in-app purchases to get to certain parts of the game or whatever. On iOS, there's a much bigger market for games that people actually just pay for. Like mm -hmm. they literally pay for the game. It could mm -hmm. be $5 or more. Um, so if you had some service that was like an annual cost and it included some selection of games like we see on Xbox Game Pass today, you know, that's the hook. The idea is it's $9.99 a month or $100 a year. You have over one, I don't know the exact comp, but on Xbox Game Pass, it's over 100 on Sony's service, which I think is called PS Now. There are probably three times that, whatever it is, and it goes back across previous versions of their platform. But, um, you know, you're paying for the the variety. It's like a cable subscription. You don't, you don't get one channel you, you know, or one show. You know, you're getting whatever they have on offer. And it's, I think that would, I think there's enough of a market for that to, to make sense. It may not appeal to the individual who just is going to play, you know, Candy Crush or whatever, but I think between hardcore kind of Call of Duty type gamers or people who play, you know, Fortnite or uh, PUBG or whatever, and those really super casual Facebook type gamers, I think there is a, a big mass market there as well. Mm -hmm. That's true. But I mean, again, you know, Fortnite is free too. Like, I just think, I mean, it's very interesting, Alex. Well, it's, it, is it? <laughs> you know, mm. I mean, it is and it isn't, right? Um, Fortnite gamers spend a lot of money mm -hmm. on in-game stuff. And some of it's like crazy stupid. I, I have a nephew who has spent a lot of money on Fortnite, like physical items, like just like for everything from shirts to char little characters and dolls and things. And th there's a whole industry around it, you know? Right. But I mean, it's the same with people who do in-app purchases. It's sort of, I feel like it's different than someone who's saying, yes, like it makes uh, financial sense for me to join this subscription yeah. service so that I get, you know, where, you know, I get this amount of games for nine 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 a month. Yeah. That's different than like, oh, I'm going to play this free game. I love it so much. I have to keep doing it. Or like, I need to keep, I'm <laughs> well, going to buy this thing for my, this outfit. Yeah. And no, I mean, there's well, don't no compare, Don't judgment. compare it to eating. <laughs> so let's, let's <laughs> put it in like Microsoft terms, right? So one of the big things we hear 
um, with regards to say something like Office 365. There's, there's a certain contingent of people who are like, I don't like this thing. You know, I used to buy Office and I could use it forever. And now you're telling me I have to pay every year. And that's not exactly the, the change. I mean, uh, when you used to buy Office before, which you would spend lots and lots of money on, it could only run on one computer. It couldn't run anywhere else. You couldn't give it to other people. You couldn't use it all over the place. With an Office 365 subscription, you get you can install that on any number of computers. You get a terabyte of disk space, like we were saying, on OneDrive. If you buy the home version, which is the one that's $9.99, you can do that with six different people in your family. So overall, you're doling out six terabytes of storage and the ability to put Office on an unlimited number of computers, tablets, phones, and just have access to that stuff everywhere. But that's not really the end of it because that version of Office you used to buy never improved. It never changed. You bought this thing that was frozen in stone. Microsoft upgrades Office 365 every single month. And so across the desktop applications, the mobile apps, the online services, and the web apps, those things are getting upgraded with new features over the course of the subscription you have. It never ends. You, it keeps getting better. So you don't buy this one thing that's frozen in time on one computer that you can't share, that has no online storage associated with it. You're buying this thing that's always getting better and better. And I, th you know, again, it, I, having heard that, there's some people out there saying, I don't care. <laughs> I want, I want this thing. And I, you know, and yep. Okay. They still make that. And, and gaming will be like this as well. Whether we're talking about, you know, Xbox, the, whatever the service is going to be called or these Apple thing or whatever other companies are going to do, you'll have that choice. And some people will say, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to play Fortnite. It's free. And that's all I want. Um, but I think some people will see the value in this type of service and they'll be like, yeah, actually this makes sense. You know? Yeah. It'll be interesting. Maybe, um, I should buy an Xbox and find out if it's the same as iOS gaming. I, that was the smartest thing you've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or you could wait for X cloud Microsoft streaming yep. service and it's going to be on iPhone. Be quiet, you. So. No, buy an Xbox. <laughs> well, apparently they're on sale. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, can yes, I play Monument right Valley on the Xbox? <laughs> Actually, I don't. That's a good question. I don't know. Okay. I assume it's powerful enough. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know? I mean, Monument Valley is a has a very specific kind of mobile. You know, it's one of those things. I don't know that Monument Valley would have ever been created if it weren't for mobile devices, right? Which is one of the cool things about mobile gaming. Um, the, the form factor itself and its unique capabilities with regards to touch and, you know, moving it around, accelerometer, whatever, have caused, you know, uh, creative game developers to come up with the new new things that maybe with a joystick or a gamepad may, n might not have happened, you know. So is it, I don't know if it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> Seems like a mobile only game. Yeah. Um, Yes. Sorry. So we've moved along. So the tip this week is uh, is a tip I could probably use almost every week, which is that um, it seems like the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X uh, are always on sale, <laughs> pretty much always on sale. Uh, the very best time to buy them, by the way, is always during the holidays. There are incredible Black Friday deals and other deals over the holidays, but uh, it seems like every so often, by which I mean every other week, um, Microsoft has a $50 off sale and they're having one now. <laughs> so... Uh, Xbox One S bundles uh, are 250 usually, and uh, the ones for the uh, Xbox One X, which of course is the uh, 4K HDR version, uh, I should say 4K version, uh, usually start at about $450. Um, if you are a Battlefield fan, I will point out that bundle in particular is really good because it comes with uh, previous versions of the game as well. Battlefield 1, Battlefield 1943, which if I'm not mistaken is the original. Um, so it, it's actually three games, and... 250 bucks. You know, that's pretty, that's really good for an Xbox. And the app pick of the week? I mean, unless, Mary oh, Jo, do you have anything else you want to say about the Xbox? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> right. Sorry. I do have one more Xbox thing before we get to that. Okay. Sorry. Um, you know, I, have, I do have an Xbox thing. Xbox okay. Live was just down for a while. Did you guys see yeah. that? People were freaking out. <laughs> not for everybody, by the way. I had my no, Xbox not on. For and it was yeah. Yep. Just thought I'd um, throw that in for color. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. I, we'll get through this. All right. So, <laughs> um, 
Oh, you were going to say right? one more every, thing about Xbox. <laughs> yeah. Every, every Friday, geez. Every month, uh, Microsoft has uh, four games that it gives away to Xbox Live Gold subscribers through something called Games with Gold. And so they just announced what those four games are. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about it this month because last month's choices for me weren't all that great. But this year it's like Jedi Knight Academy, Assassin's Creed Rogue. Um, there's some good games in there. So it's basically $90 of games that will be available for free if you're a subscriber. So that's uh, good to remember, you know, put it on your calendar. So starting uh, January 1st, you really get the first two games. And then January, I'm sorry, January 1st, uh, February 1st. And then February 16th, you'll be able to get the other two games. Um, they haven't announced this yet, but obviously, uh, not obviously, but every month they also uh, add games to the games, Xbox Game Pass uh, subscription as well. Um, so we'll, that should happen any day now. We'll see what, what that looks like for February soon as well. How much is that subscription, the gold? Subscription? That's the one that's 99 a year or 999 a month. Mm. So that's, you get, it's some number, 100 and whatever games that you can Download, install, play on your console for the lifetime of the subscription, whatever number you want to use. And this is yours too, Paul, the app pick of the week, right? Is that you? <laughs> right. For anyone tired of my voice, I apologize. I'll be done soon. <laughs> so um, <laughs> probably no one is tired of it as me. Uh, yeah, so oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've undergone this um, uh, scanning process where I finally, I, I've, I, we have whatever photo albums we have remaining from the past. I got a high-speed photo scanner, which, you know, depending on the photos, because some of them come out of sticky albums, either works great or work, it still works better than a flatbed scanner. But it's a big task, and I want to, you know, uh, add the metadata and so forth so that it has, like, the right date, if I can find the right date. I'd love to put the correct location information in there like you have now in modern photos. Um, but I'm going to digitize our old, old photos and then throw them all away. And so I started on that, uh, I don't know, last weekend, I guess, or two weekends ago, and I will spend the rest of my life doing it. But um, one of the things I wanted to find was a good application for some of this, you know, uh, you know, auto correction and, and, you know, metadata and all this kind of stuff. And I have Photoshop Elements. I, I actually bought the version from the Microsoft Store, which I generally recommend. The version I have is not the latest version. It's the previous version, which is called uh, Photoshop Elements 15. I think the latest version might be called Photoshop Elements 2019 or something like that. But uh, it's a good app. You know, it's a, it's normally $100. Um, I can install it on any number of computers, which I like because of the store. Um, but I ran into a problem with it. So I, I wanted to, uh, you can use the organizer part of it to edit metadata, which is super useful. It works really well. And it even has this option for adding location data and I thought well, this is fantastic I'll use this thing I already bought year you know a year ago whatever and it says because of some license that ran out with Google we can no longer offer this plugin for this application but if you buy Photoshop elements 2019 you can have it and I thought you know what <laughs> that is that's not cool and um, so I started looking around and I got some feedbacks from some readers, and one of them recommended this thing uh, that I remember from back in the day, like back in the day, like 1995 back in the day, called ACDC. And it turns out these guys are still around, and they sell various versions of their photo editing application, uh, which run from prices from 60 to probably $200. They have, you know, lifetime subscriptions and whatever, and they have very powerful versions and whatever. But the basic version of this product, which is just called ACDC Photo Editor, it's normally $60, but it's on sale right now for $25. And I thought, well, I'll give this a try because they have a free trial. You can use it for a month. And honestly, it is one of the best Photoshop clone type apps I think I've ever used. It's really, really nice. And obviously as a photo, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but it, it's particularly good for, you know, just people who take photographs. I know that sounds goofy, but I often use um, Photoshop to edit images, not so much my own personal photographs, but rather images I'm going to use on the website. And so I, you know, I can crop and do whatever I do. But this, this, this application is like incredible photo editing, you know, features that are very useful for someone like me who's doing the scanning stuff. So um, because it's available for a 30 day trial, there's no risk. You should, if you need such a thing and you don't want to pay the hundred dollars or more or whatever um, for other applications like Photoshop elements, um, you should look at this. It's, surprisingly good 
And maybe it shouldn't be because it's been around, you know, they've been around for a long time, actually. And is it cross-platform or just on Windows? I am not sure, but I believe that these guys do make Mac apps as well. This this particular one might be only Windows. Um, that I'm not sure about. Mm. You know, I know, like I know on the Mac, well, on Windows too, but uh, there's a, um, what is it called? Uh, da, 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 da. What's that Photoshop clone? Clone that's a really big deal, like iPad, Mac, Affinity oh, Photo. Oh, yeah, maybe? Affinity Photo. And then there's a photo. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of them. But Affinity is one yeah. that is like Photoshop. There's apps. There's lots of stuff that, mm -hmm. you know, they're Photoshop like apps, you know, mm -hmm. paint.net and, uh, you know, the GIMP and so forth. But as far as like, like really full featured photo, Editing, you know, I want to auto enhance and reduce red eye and do metadata and whatever. Like, this is actually one of the best ones I've ever seen. Hmm. It's cheap, especially it, right now. Yeah, it does look like it's just on Windows. Um, yeah. It was sorry. invented back in the day when you only did make apps for Windows. That's right. Yeah. They, these guys <laughs> really go back, I mean, to the 90s. Yeah. I remember one of the, the 90s. I remember ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Friends. Remember that show? <laughs> Now, Mary Jo, um, we can talk about the enterprise. We're done with all that um, consumer stuff. <laughs> Good. Sorry. Because I've got some doozies of pics to talk about here. Okay. Not, not as exciting as Photoshop clones, but, you know, for <laughs> the enterprise, there's some other things going on. One thing is there are two new dashboards that are rolling out for Microsoft 365 customers, Office 365 customers. Um, one is called the Microsoft 365 Security Center and one is called the Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. So what these are are centralized dashboards where IT pros and admins can have a single glance and see kind of the whole comprehensive view of what's going on in, in their estate, as Microsoft calls it. So if you have the Security Center dashboard, you'll see how many of your, of your um, users meet a certain secure score. Um, you can see who's at risk, who's compliant with your um, with your ver various policies you set up, how many devices are at risk for malware. So uh, like a very useful quick snapshot of things going on pertaining to security in your organization. Compliance Center is a similar type dashboard for compliance officers, you know, and with GDPR and more and more privacy and compliance um rules and regulations, not just in Europe, but everywhere. The, this also could be quite handy. It'll show you things like, um, you know, what, how far along you, you are on your compliance checklist. You can assess your app compliance and see your, again, your total compliance score um, measured against all these different standards um, that you may need to meet uh, based on the industry that you're in. So both of these are now in the midst of rolling out worldwide. Um, and Microsoft says, by March, everybody should have access to these who are Microsoft 365 customers. While we're on the topic, though, of the cloud and Office 365 and Microsoft 365, I just have to mention, it has not been a banner week for Microsoft in the cloud. <clears throat> um, if you were based in Europe and using a Microsoft European data center, you may have been among the people who last week found out they couldn't access their email. Um, Exchange online issues were plaguing um, some, at least one Microsoft European data center so that people could not access their inbox. And at first it looked like that was a one day issue, which is pretty bad, but it actually ended up dragging on for multiple days. Um, the problem was for many customers that Microsoft was telling them to go and look at the administration dash dashboard for the latest updates on what was going on. But if you're just a user and not an admin, you couldn't see that. And so all these users were screaming on Twitter, hey, does anyone know Microsoft Outlook is completely down and we can't get into our email box? So that went on for like two plus days. Then yesterday, um, a lot of people were reporting that they couldn't open safe links in their emails. And that was another issue that hit Microsoft Office 365. And then to top it all off yesterday, they had a major authentication issue worldwide 
for the Microsoft Cloud Services, Office 365, Dynamics 365, and Azure. And they actually, the whole service went down for a number of people for several hours at the end of yesterday. So yeah, I don't know what to tell you about what's going on there, but let's just say it, it, it wasn't a good week. And if you were wondering what was going on, my recommendation for you is to follow an account on Twitter called Microsoft 365 Status. Um, a lot of people I was pointing this out to yesterday didn't even know this existed. It's at MSFT365 Status. And that's your best chance of kind of finding out what's going on when there are these kind of massive outages. They update those statuses there fairly regularly, though not as much as they, I think they should. Uh, but at least you'll have some knowledge that Microsoft does know there's a problem and they're working on it. So that's that's a tip uh, kind of thing, pick slash tip. And then they said uh, that they uh, that they fixed it. Yeah, it they said fixed, huh? they said all of these things are now fixed, um, and have been fixed for a few uh, several hours. Um, so yeah, let's hope they're that's the end of that <laughs> because mm -hmm. that was kind of a rough one. And then the code name pick of the week. Yeah, so this is this was a funny thing that popped up on Windows blogs today. I thought this was already out and available, but Project Rome. Do you remember that, Paul, from Bill mm -hmm. 2016? I uh, looked this Project, one up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Project Rome um, is, is something Microsoft was working on for developers to let them write apps that could work across multiple devices and kind of travel with people as they switch between devices. So somewhat like Apple handoff. Um, yeah. It was originally just this, like Microsoft devices, right? But then it they expanded was. it to yep. Android and Then they iOS. expanded it across platform. Um, as of today, Project Rome, uh, the software development kit 1.0 is out. I thought this was out a long time ago. But if you go um, to the Windows blog, it gives you a link to the documentation on the Microsoft Docs site. And um, it talks about how the APIs and the graph APIs work. And this to me says they're setting, they're kind of setting things up for more cross uh, cross device support, maybe with the your phone application, um, kind of pick up where you left off stuff also relies on project Rome. So this could be why the documentation is now out for iOS and Android devices for developers. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a throwback to the code name of the past back to 2016, but project Rome SDK for iOS and Android is now at version 1.0. I'm surprised wow. that, you know, the, the announcement was so short. It, it seems was. like this is should be something of excitement, you know. I know. I thought so, too. Yeah. It's like a couple of paragraphs, and then here's some links to our yeah. documentation. Here's some links, you know. Yeah. yeah, we did this thing. We've been working on it for four years. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, before we get to the beer pick, uh, we should mention that right after we're recording this live, uh, the uh, Q2 right. earnings call is happening. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? They're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> yep. Going to hear lots of commercial cloud, blah, 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 record levels, how great everything is going with people moving to the cloud. And I think you're going to hear a lot about um, Surface and Xbox and both having a good holiday quarter. Probably that will figure into earnings given that Q2 yeah, um, ended in December, you, right? You folks on the Apple side of the fence, um, you'd be happy to know we've been dealing with the no unit sales thing for a long time now. So we're getting really comfortable <laughs> with that. Um, yeah. Maybe Apple will evolve to the point where they start inventing pretend businesses to show that they're doing well in some area. The commercial cloud thing that Mary Jo just mentioned falls into that category. It's not a business. Yeah. Um, it's just a, an a unknown combination of things that they cherry pick uh, from around the company. And for all we know, it changes from month to month. And we don't have no idea. They don't tell us what it is. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give anyone listening uh, live right now a tip. I think... Remember last week we talked about the Power Platform and Power Apps and all that good <laughs> stuff, Power Apps onesies. Um, I think you're going to hear about that in today's earnings call. Hmm. Just just a wow. little tip there. No Project Rome? No, no. Do you think um, <laughs> earnings happening today will impact us getting or not getting a build for Windows 10? Oh, yeah, I do. I think I bet the build comes tomorrow or it comes after yeah. earnings, but I bet tomorrow. The way earnings work for Microsoft and I think many companies is 
the day of earnings and even several days leading up to earnings, they try yeah, not to make any huge announcements just in case anything bad happens and then it affects what people ask about on the call or earnings and earnings themselves too. Yeah, so um, I don't know why we keep going back to Apple, but you I know, don't the, know the, why the, either. <laughs> It's Megan, but um, I, if you look at what they did with the uh, FaceTime vulnerability where they were quiet about it for like a week, mm -hmm. right? I actually think that was tied to their earnings. Um, I, I don't think they wanted to have that. I, I think they tried not to acknowledge that <laughs> until earnings happened. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way, I guess. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think there is a thing with these companies where uh, we have enough going on here, you know. We don't want some some little weird that has not, thing that has nothing to do with anything, frankly, impact our stock price and and whatever, right? Uh, I'm sure that's the impetus behind that kind of decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and now finally, the beer pick of the week. <laughs> Right. So I'm looking out the window right now here. It's just finally starting to snow. And, you know, we're having the polar vortex thing here in the United States right now. It's super cold, especially in the Midwest. So, you know, what kind of beer is great for that? An imperial stout. Mm. And based in the Midwest, Bell's Brewing, which is Comstock, Michigan, um, they make an excellent one that is called Bell's Black Note Stout. So how they make this is they take two of their stouts. They take expedition stout and double cream stout. They combine them. They put them in oak aged oak bourbon barrels and age it for several months. And out comes this delicious stout. The thing that's interesting about this stout to me is if you've ever had a bourbon barrel stout, sometimes they just taste like bourbon, which isn't a bad thing. But if you want to taste the beer and the bourbon, this is a really good beer uh, because it it's not overpowered by bourbon, but you can Definitely have the bourbon flavor and taste permeating it. Um, I had a 2017 version of this recently, um, which was super smooth and delicious, but they, they, I believe, are still continuing to make it, so you may find something more current. But it's definitely worth a try if you can get your hands on it. Bell's Black Note Stout. Does it come in a, like a wine bottle or is it like a beer bottle size? Comes, I think, a large format um, type bottle. Okay. For beer. Mm. Yeah, looks like one of those yeah. Chimay yeah. type tops. Mm. Yeah. It's good. It's tw it's 10.8%. It's a lot. not a light beer, <laughs> but it gets 100 on rape beer. Sure. It's the root vegetable of beers. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it what you will be drinking during the earnings call? I need something. <laughs> you know, every time they say power platform, I think everyone who's listening should drink. <laughs> okay. Well, Mary Jo, Paul, thank you again for having me on your show. Um, I always learn a lot and I appreciate you having me. I mean, you didn't really have a choice, but yep. thank you. No, no. Thank you for force feeding <laughs> us, Megan, for everybody. It. No, it's always good to have you. <laughs> I always learn things about Apple when you're on oh, the show. Good. <laughs> Um, Mary Jo Foley from all about Microsoft and dot com and at Mary Jo Foley on Twitter and Paul Throt at Throt.com and Throt on Twitter. Thank you both. And one more thing. It's time again for our Twit survey. Do not forget to fill that out. We want to know more about you. Uh, Mary Jo and Paul want to know more about you. Um, not the secret stuff, just the stuff that you're interested <laughs> on the show. Well, what are we talking about? <laughs> Twit.to uh, twit slash survey19. Um, and also our advertisers want to know. So you want to hear ads that you're interested in. So um, take some time, go fill that out. And of course, subscribe to the show. Subscribe to Windows Weekly if you're not already subscribed. And so that's it. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you, Mary Jo and Paul, for having me on your show. And uh, we'll see you next week on Windows Weekly. Bye.